Okay, let me first uh, introduce you. I will say a couple of words in Russian, and then we uh, we start. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, я коротко представлю uh, нашу гостью. Uh, очень uh, мы рады, uh, счастливы uh, видеть Оленку Зубачич. Uh, действительно, uh, одного из самых наших интересных философов современности. Uh, Оленка приехала к нам из Любляны. Uh, она представитель uh, так называемой Люблянской школы психоанализа. Uh, именно ее труды uh, вдохновили, вдохновляют до сих пор таких авторов, как uh, Слава Ижижик и Младен Далар, которые уже здесь были uh, uh, не, неоднократно в нашем городе, а вот Оленка приехала впервые. Uh, и uh, ну, такая коротенькая библиографическая, биографическая заметочка, она uh, работает исследователем в Институте философии Славянской академии наук, вот там есть такое, такая же академия наук, как у нас академия наук примерно, вот она э, и такой же институт философии, но не совсем такой же, намного лучше, конечно, и вот там вот как раз э, Оленка Дюпанчич работает исследователем, а также она является приглашенным, почему вы смеетесь надо мной? Не надо, не надо. Я, я работаю в институте философии Российской академии наук, так что. Вот, там тоже все, ну, конечно, да, смешно, но не так. А, да, приглашенным профессором такой интересной институции, известной, которая называется European Radio School, а, и, ну и автором множества замечательных книг а, об этике, о психоанализе, о литературе, а, комедии, любви. А, книги такие. Этика реального Кант и Лакан в 2000 году появилась эта книжка в печати. Короткая тень, философия двоицы, или как сказать, двух, двойки Ницше, 2003 год. Пятое условие Ален Бадью и будущее философии. Хотел сказать будущее человечества, но в принципе будущее философии для Бадью это одно и то же. Да. 2004 год о комедии, тоже 2007. Почему или зачем психоанализ? Why psychoanalysis? Это книжка 2008. И книга, которую вот мы представляем сейчас, это последняя книга Оленки. Что такое секс? Что такое секс? Она появилась вот только что. Вот свежая книжка только что вышла, и только что из печи горячая мы ее. Uh, уже читаем и собираемся здесь обсуждать. Ну и лекция, соответственно, у нас посвящена онтологическим таким аспектам сексуальности. Все, uh, передаю слово нашему докладчику. Nice because we will be moving in the same kind of waters, but with different emphasis. And uh, I think what I think I know that what I will try to do today is to relate perhaps more directly what I consider to be this kind of uh, ontological impact or relevance uh, of psychoanalysis for philosophy. I will try to consider this also more specifically in a political context or uh, with this kind of examples. So this will be just me speaking my Slovene English. Uh, if um, at any point something is not clear linguistically or otherwise, you just please brutally interrupt me and I will try to repeat or explain or whatever. Uh, but otherwise I will just deliver my lecture. So. Okay, I work on this in this intersection of philosophy and psychoanalysis, and as I think all of you agree, probably this is probably why you are here today. This has been for some quite uh, time a very productive site in contemporary philosophy. This combination with uh, psychoanalysis, lots of interesting works, starting with the uh, old work of Slavoj Žižek and so on, came out of this uh, combination of this uh, constructing site, uh, combining uh, philosophy and particularly German idealism and uh, psychoanalysis. 
And it is interesting, I mean, one question could be why? And I think one possible answer to this is that precisely at the point where philosophers in this kind of uh, postmodern fashion started to kind of really giving up very fast and very decidedly on some of their traditional concepts like subject, truth, uh, real and so on. Uh, and were eager to kind of get rid of them as belonging to this metaphysical past that we were all trying to escape from. Uh, along came Lacan and I think taught us this invaluable lesson, namely that it is not so much these concepts themselves that are problematic as a certain way of handling them, of understanding them, of using them. And actually it was a very interesting uh, thing that uh, some of these uh, concepts survived philosophically, I would say, precisely thanks to this kind of uh, shifting them or taking them in combination with the uh, psychoanalytic uh, Lacanian, particularly in Freudian uh, perspective on these notions like subject, truth, real as opposed or different to reality and so on. So I think this was a very productive uh, twist in within contemporary philosophy. Uh, and I think it was, one could also claim this for psychoanalysis, that precisely because it was part of this larger philosophical debate, it remained with Lacan part of this larger philosophical debate, and was not simply um, kind of confined, circumscribed to its feud, to its uh, local practice, uh, that it kind of flourished and produced some extremely interesting insights. And actually, this was precisely Lacan's point, his quarrel also with these traditional psychoanalytic institutions like International Psychoanalytic Association, uh, the divide that he kept pointing to, namely the divide precisely between uh, psychoanalysis uh, analysis as a recognized therapeutic practice appropriately confined to its field and what seemed to be Lacan's intellectual and also clinical extravagances, which were quite all over the place, I say, like literature, philosophy, you name it. I mean, he was really erudite also in this science, of course, science and theory of science. Uh, and it was here that actually Lacan situated the divide between what he considered to be like interesting. Uh, productive way of doing psychoanalysis and what he saw as a kind of a sterile or self-perpetuating um, establishment, psychoanalytical establishment, uh, namely apart from his famous short sessions, for, his, for we, well, I think it was even for them that he was excluded from these associations, apart from these uh, short sessions, actually intellectualization was the key word, the key insult uh, aimed at what he was doing. This was really the kind of how to recognize the enemies, that it was kind of intellectualization of psychoanalysis. Um, an insult uh, aimed by analysts whom, of course, Lacan did not hesitate to insult back, calling them orthopedists of the unconscious. This is, I, I like this formulation and also guarantors or guarantors of the bourgeois dream. So this was kind of a, a, yeah, a, um, a war between the, the, the establishment. So, um, but of course this intellectualization, I think we, sh we should uh, really um, say that it was not simply due to Lacan's persona, to his own erudition, to his own uh, whatever intelligence, uh, uh, ambition, but um, also it was what he recognized to be at the very core of Freud's discovery. It was precisely what Lacan thought was causing the biggest scandal in Freud's theory. Namely, what he also formulated as follows, that the unconscious thinks. It is not simply something irrational or from the other dark side of, of whatever. It is, there is something uh, uncannily rational in how the unconscious um, uh, operates. 
and not only rational, all these phenomena that Freud kind of started, uh, not from, but to, yeah, to some extent started from, like ingenious dreams, slips of the tongue, uh, jokes and so on, these are all highly spiritual forms, creations. They are not some kind of... Uh, so they are all manifestation of this, whatever, work of the unconscious. Um, and of course, and this I think it's also a very important point, uh, Lacan also liked to point out how the actually the biggest scandal uh, uh, involved in the Freudian theory of sexuality as related to the unconscious was not its alleged dirtiness, that it was all oh, these dirty, naughty things, but, and this is a quote from Lacan, uh, the greatest scandal was that it was so intellectual. It was in this respect that it showed itself to be the worthy stooge of all these terrorists whose plots were going to ruin society. So you see the, what he recognized as a kind of problematic, the, the reason why Freudian theory was, really was kind of um, aligned with the terrorist plots attempting to ruin the society was not some whatever association with dirty sex, but rather association with uh, highly intellectual, between highly intellectual activities and sexuality. So the sex itself was highly intellectual activity, finally. Okay, so, but if we can agree that this um, encounter between uh, psychoanalysis and philosophy uh, was very fruitful and inspiring uh, site for both, uh, perhaps we can also agree that avoiding this site has become something of a fashion lately in both philosophy and uh, psychoanalysis. Um, namely, philosophers have kind of rediscovered pure philosophy or pure ontology, if you want. Um, and they're pretty much engaged now in producing new ontology. It is sometimes it's even funny. Everybody has his or her own, own ontology now. And they see a little interest in what looks to be, at the best, like a kind of regional theory of regional uh, ontology corresponding to a particular therapeutic practice. So there is a kind of a uh, moving away from this perspective and also aligning very wrongly, I think, this perspective, psychedelic perspective, as with something purely subjective, with this kind of a, uh, as to use the Meyasu famous, Meyasu's famous expression, correlationist, some kind of, that we can actually not talk about reality if it is not in some way correlated to the subject. So this is then when a psychoanalysis kind of gets uh, uh, pulled into this uh, thing completely wrongly. I think it's, uh, there is a strong argument to be made for uh, a psychoanalysis as to some extent at least realist ontology, but I developed this in some other articles. I won't go into this. Today, so okay, this this is on the side of philosophy, and I think there is perhaps a similar, but on the other side, uh, uh, movement or mood that prevails uh, within uh, uh, psychoanalysis today, uh, which is also uh, which is that the psychoanalysts are kind of rediscovering this experimental clinical core of uh, their theory. And sometimes they like to present it uh, to some extent, at least, as their holy grail, you know, that only they are in touch with and nobody else. So they are kind of hostile very often now to the kind of uh, any kinds of philosophical discussions, at least some schools of psychoanalysis, philosophical discussions of their notions, their, uh, their, their concepts, saying that this actually makes no sense, it cannot be done outside. Uh, the context of uh, psychoanalysis as practice. But so there is this kind of disentanglement of something that I think was kind of really interesting and productive. And okay, as for myself, I still really much, very much believe in this uh, con construct, uh, construction site and continue to work um, in it, within it. Um, and this, this last project, uh, Sex and Ontology, was precisely 
about this. Um, and here, as concerns the, the question of uh, sexuality, my claim is actually double. Namely, first, that um, in psychoanalysis, sex is above all a concept, it's clearly a concept, it's not simply some empirical thing, it is a concept that formulates uh, a persisting contradiction, not only of reality, but I would go as far as to say of being, qua being. So that there is a, this concept has, this is why I claim that it has consequences for a certain way of looking at or talking about ontology. Uh, and second claim would be that this uh, contradiction of reality or being is, cannot be circumscribed or reduced to a precisely to simply secondary or if you want ontic level as a contradiction between let's say already well established beings or elements uh, but is as this kind of more fundamental contradiction involved in the very structuring of the of these entities or of the if you want the, the, the topology of the space of being qua being and this is why i think uh, sex uh, as the concept uh, is of ontological relevance, uh, not as an ultimate reality behind all uh, other realities, but as an inherent twist or stumbling block of reality such as it is very much up front here. Um, so, and uh, I think you can also see how um, this question, sex and ontology, actually uh, takes the two philosophy and psychoanalysis precisely at the point where, I guess, the stakes of their possible disunion are the highest. Of course, if you think a little bit about uh, contemporary philosophy, you can see that uh, sex is the question usually left out even in most friendly philosophical appropriations of uh, psychoanalysis. I mean, people who very much accept Lacan and work with him for very, I mean, like from Alain Badiou to you know, all of us, and to, to, there are many, many concepts starting from the big other, the truth, the subject, the four discourses, and so on, which are appropriated or worked with within philosophy, but somehow uh, sex is somehow one doesn't know what to do with it philosophically. And on the other hand, Ontology is also something that uh, psychoanalysis that doesn't know what to do with, doesn't accept as a kind of a immediate uh, interrogation. Or the, Lacan had this uh, line that ontology as such is actually a discourse of the master. Uh, he made this interesting pun between maître, master, and uh, written with apostrophe, me être being. So, and ontology, he says, implies being at someone's heel. This can, there is a certain kind of order. It's being at the order of someone. So, just so there is a certain idea that, that ontology can only survive or be relevant if at some, in some way, one points out this interesting, whatever, thing that it is struggling with or that it is uh, hiding. Okay, but so for me it is precisely because the, the stakes are the higher in this kind of uh, uh, combination that uh, um, I decided to kind of try to look at it, this combination or this interaction of sexuality and ontology more closely. Okay, so this book came um, out of this and of course I want to explain and re-explain it here. Uh, I cannot start from the scratch or try to develop all this concept, so I will simply uh, pick one um, formula, which I think probably all of you know very well, uh, and try to, uh, starting from this formula, try to show a little bit what is this, um, what I think, where this connection is heading between ontology and sex, and what could be its particularly its implications, like if we look at the more largely at the social political space. So I will take the, the formula that everybody probably knows very well or at least heard about, which is this famous, there is no sexual relation. Um, 
So this formula is a strong formula, and it. Uh, I will first perhaps say a few things about how I think it should not be understood, or how it is very often wrongly understood, uh, precisely on this kind of a simple ontic level. Namely, this claim of Lacan is often understood as simply kind of very clever sounding um, formulation of something that, uh, I don't know, people, poems, literature, and so on, have always known and kept repeating in different ways, namely that lasting or true love is impossible, or that love is mostly unhappy, or if you want this kind of a fashionable titles, that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. So there is no relationship. The relationship don't work. There is there are only series of missed encounters, or there are only atomized particles, uh, like in this famous novel. So I think, first of all, this is precisely how not to understand this claim. Uh, this actually is the kind of understanding that moves much too quickly and really overrides or covers up, I would say, the real uh, expressed conveyed by this uh, formula of Lacan's. Uh, it is understood too fastly and we kind of tend to exclaim, oh yes, but of course there is no sexual relationship. This makes perfect sense. Of course, this is why we are where we are. Right? This is why we are miserable in our whatever love life. Um, and in this way, of course, this non-relation is understood as a kind of ultimate truth, or even the ultimate code, the ultimate formula of reality. The truth is admittingly not very pleasant, but at least uh, this is how things are, and we can now understand them, make sense of these miseries. Um, so in this understanding, we are led to conclude that the non-relation is the cause of oddities and difficulties within uh, with all concrete relationships. Um, or that it is the obstacle, actually the active obstacle of any successful concrete empirical relationship. This non-relation, of course, that Lacan, perhaps I should stress this earlier, links precisely by something within the very signifying order uh, being not there, or that there is no, as he puts it, binary signifier. I mean, signify, there is no signifying relation that uh, not only that could account for sex, but even signifiers are such, are not in this, any kind of complementary uh, relation that, that would form a relation in this precise sense. So there is no signifying binary, and this is what is uh, falling out, as he also calls it, of the binary signifier is precisely what then opens up the whole signifying chain, the whole multi multitude of signifiers. Okay, so, but Lacan's point is not that this, whatever, the absence of this signifier or this non which implies the non-relation, the fact that precisely there is no signifying relation at the core of this, is the, not the obstacle to the formation of any concrete relationship. His point is actually, and perhaps paradoxically, almost the opposite. Uh, namely, it is only the inexistence of the relation that opens up the space for relationships and ties as we know them. And I'm not like just making this up, just a very brief quote from Lacan. He says, the absence of the relation does, of course, not prevent the tie, la liaison. Far from it, it dictates its conditions. You see, the claim is very different. The non-relation kind of gives, dictates the conditions of what ties us. Which is to say that, of course, again, it is not a simple indifferent absence, but an absence that kind of uh, curves, deforms, determines, but also enables the structure with which it appears. It is part of it. Or perhaps we could say the non-relation is not the opposite of the relationship in this sense, but rather the kind of inherent uh, logic or illogic or fundamental antagonism 
of the relationships that are there and very much possible and existing and some of them functioning very well. Um, so this is, uh, this is, I think, a very important thing that uh, actually what takes place at the point of this non-relation, and I will also come to this in a moment, uh, is also this surplus, this uh, whatever, surplus enjoyment, as Lacan calls it, uh, which of course is very much involved in all forming of ties, be it, uh, between, uh, I mean, in love or between individuals or uh, largely in social context, like social ties. Um, so, perhaps very uh, concisely put, we could say that uh, biased as it is, it is by this constitutive negativity, this uh, falling out or non-existence of the binary signifier, uh, the structure is always more or less than what it is. It is not simply identical to itself. It is always more or less than simply the sum, the sum, the cutting up of its element. And moreover, the, uh, the causal link between these elements that uh, appear in it, uh, the signifying element, is very much influenced by what appears, I also claim, at the site precisely of this negativity, of this gap, and which is both heterogeneous and inseparable from the, the signifying symbolic order, namely the surplus enjoyment. Lacan calls the surplus enjoyment and also provides this kind of a highly, I think, original and uh, uh, important, one of the most important new concepts that were invented, I think, in 20th century, uh, the concept of the uh, objet A, of the object small a, which is precisely not the object in this usual sense of the term like a glass, or the, it is something that is at the same time, both at the same time, both uh, immaterial and extremely material, and so it's uh, it is a kind of a yeah object that one sh definitely has to account with. So what is this object A, which is one name of the surplus enjoyment, which is also the name of the what Lacan calls the object of desire, which is precisely not simply this or that person, but that in that person which is more than that person precisely. So this object uh, is not a sexual object. It is rather, as I think he even writes it at, uh, like this at some point, asexual, like a small a in italic and sexual. Uh, it, we could also say that it is a kind of objective counterpart of the, uh, this non-relation, but as I said earlier, it is also precisely what is at work in all forming of ties, in all forming of relationship. It is the very structuring of uh, the unity. And if you look, for instance, at this, if you are a little bit into Lacanian theory, uh, all these formulas of different social ties or discourses, which uh, play with four letters, these letters, small a, the, the surplus enjoyment, is there in all of them. Like, uh, the, irreducible element of any social tie. Uh, and with this in mind, I think it is actually more than a pun or a play on words to suggest that what follows, I think, from, from Lacan's uh, conceptualization here in respect to this uh, uh, negativity, this gap, this lack of the binary signifier and this object, small a, that appears and structures the space, one could actually say that what is at stake here is, um, this is a kind of a proposition that I make, object disoriented ontology. If there is an ontology, and this is not simply meant as a joke, it is, if there is an ontology that follows from psychoanalytic or Lacanian theory, this can only be an ontology as precisely disoriented but what he, by what he calls this object A. Kind of uh, thrown out of joint by it, but also perpetuated through it. Um, okay, so I think in any case, what I think is very valuable in this Freud-Lacanian concept of, uh, 
uh, of sexuality and of non-relation as first uh, posited in this context is that it introduces actually a kind of conceptual model of thinking the non-relation precisely as dictating conditions of different kind of ties, including social ties or so-called discourses. And I think this is also why one can perhaps reaffirm with a slightly different accent this well-known slogan that sexual is political. You know. not Sexual is political not simply in the sense of sexuality as a realm uh, of being where also political struggles take place. Of course, this exists. But also in a stronger sense that a kind of true emancipatory politics can be taught only on the ground of this kind of object disoriented ontology, as I tried to sketch it. That is precisely what I mean by this is ontology that uh, pursues not simply being qua being, being as being, but precisely the crack or what Lacan names the real, that kind of hounds being from within, informs it, that is inseparable from being, yet it is not qua being. There is something in being which is not fully qua being. I think this is somehow what, how I read this uh, uh, concept also of the real as this kind of irreducible, impossible in, in Lacan. Okay. So, we can say, if I just make this kind of a very fast um, extrapolation, we could say that Lacan's point is that since it is one uh, with the discursive order, the non-relation uh, is at work in also in all forms of social bond somehow. It is not limited to the sphere of love. And perhaps we can even say that in the latter, in the sphere of love, uh, the, the, this sphere is perhaps even distinguished by the fact that in this sphere it actually happens from time to time that the relation kind of stops not being written as Lacan very um, sophisticatedly pointed so that, that some, something happens that uh, uh, makes it work very well even. Okay, no, and now in uh, the, the rest of my lecture I would just like to uh, interrogate some of these social implications and consequences of this non-relation thesis, of how it can be perhaps seen and uh, worked with product productively when looked at some social phenomena. Uh, so what, if we say that there is this non-relation also at the very uh, foundation of any social tie, what could this mean? Um, of course, very often, Emancipation is or was conceived as precisely in terms of freeing ourselves from the social non-relation. This could be one perspective in which we could see the, the, the endeavors, the, the, the battles of emancipation. Like trying to get rid of this non-relation, precisely approaching the ideal of uh, relation with capital R, even if it is unattainable, but still we should struggle to, to get there. And um, so Lacan kind of presents us with a different perspective, Nam namely one thing that I think follows from many analyses that he makes and that we can add some more to this is that perhaps at least traditionally the aim to abolish the non-relation and to replace it with a relation has rather been traditionally a kind of trademark of serious social repression. And I think here, uh, sexual difference uh, and the oppression of women are very good examples of this. Then with the most oppressive societies have always been those which automatically proclaimed or even enforced the existence precisely of the sexual relation. I mean, of this can be, of course, harmonious relation, which could be of that of subordination, but this is a kind of relation. Uh, harmonious, even if subordinating relation, presupposes an exact definition of essences involved in this relation and of roles pertaining to them. 
So if there is to be a relation, women need to be such and such. Uh, a woman who does not know her place is a menace to the image of the relation, as this kind of totality of two elements that complement each other uh, in any kind of kind of so, uh, cos cos cosmic order, be it yin yang or whatever. But then we can go into these different ways in which this is articulated. So to this, psychoanalysis does not respond by saying that woman is in fact something other than what these oppressive orders make her out to be. But as you know, probably also with a very different and much more, I think, claim powerful claim, namely woman with a capital W does not exist. Precisely, this is one other way of putting this non-existence of the binary signifier. This thing that you want to be there to complement whatever master signifier is precisely not there. Um, so, woman as a relational counterpart of man does not exist. We could also understand this like this. Um, and I think uh, in this respect, it is not a coincidence that the shift accomplished by psychoanalysis, the shift uh, from considering sexuality as a moral issue or medical issue to focusing on its problematic ontological and epistemological status. This is the shift that took place with Freud and Lacan. Uh, cast sexuality and particularly sexual difference as an immediate political problem. Not a cultural problem, not a problem of identity, but a political problem. Not a problem of human rights, but a problem of political rights. This at least is my profound conviction. At its core, at its core feminism has always been uh, a political movement. This is precisely what contemporary ideology tries to make us forget or make us dismiss precisely because it was political. Uh, we get these images supposedly of hysterical, fanatical, masculine, wild, ideological suffragettes as opposed to more kind of calm, composed women who see themselves as human beings with specific qualities and identity and try to democratically affirm it. This is the kind of opposition that we are often confronted with. Women who would also start by saying, oh, I'm not a feminist, I just, you know, this and that. So I think that true feminism actually depends precisely on positive sexual difference as a political problem, and hence on situating it in the context of the social antagonism and of emancipatory struggle. And that feminism did not start from trying to affirm some other female identity, but from the fact that roughly half of the human race referred to as women was non-existent in a political sense. And it is this non-existence, this political invisibility, which actually functioned as a homogeneity of the political space. This is the point I'm trying to make and I will... Um, and it was this homogeneity that feminism transformed precisely into a split, a division that concerns all. Hence, precisely the political dimension of it. So again, I think it is essential that this gesture is not um, simply a political affirmation of some independently existing ontological divide let's say, between men and women, but something that actually first constitutes sexual difference as difference or divide, because it became different in a very different way than before. Because it forced us to think it as a division or as a split of the same world, which was not actually the case before. The traditional division between masculine and feminine worlds or domains or spheres, for example, public, private, whatever you name it, uh, 
actually does not see sexual difference as difference in this more strong sense of the term, but as a question rather of belonging precisely to, to two separate worlds, which are different only from, let's say, this neutral bird's eye perspective description, but otherwise perfectly coexist as uh, integral parts in the hierarchy of higher cosmic order. And the wholeness and unity of which is not threatened by this difference. The fact that this subordination, this whatever, in no way threat, threatens the, the harmony, the, the cosmic order of this subordination. Uh, so these are parts that know their place. And I think feminism as a political movement put in question and broke precisely this unity of the world based on massive suppression, subordination, and exclusion. And once again, I emphasize that this exclusion was not, it's not an exclusion simply of female identity. On the contrary, the mythology of female identity is precisely what made this exclusion possible to some extent and sustained it. The, the theme of female identity sustains the difference in exclusion precisely on the pre-political level, on the level of belonging to two different words or principles or whatever you name it. And in this sense, emancipatory politics begins with precisely loss of identity. And there is nothing deplorable in this loss. As preachers of traditional values usually propagate the political exclusion of women precisely by evoking their specific identity. And I think it's not enough simply to dispute the content of this identity, but that there is something wrong with this move uh, such as it is. They believe that uh, women exist, of course, uh, and they need her to exist in this sense. Um, but down there, of course, when kind of precisely excluded from the political space, which exists as well because uh, there is this underpinning, uh, throwing out of a certain element. So is it the right response to fill up this woman with different content and to promote her as the other voice, the voice of authority, which also needs to be heard and affirmed? No, I think the political explosion is precisely of the woman question does not lie in any specificity or positive characteristics of women, but precisely in this capacity to inscribe the problem of division and difference into the world, the homogeneity of which depends and it's based on precisely the exclusion. The exclusion, and this perhaps this is the crucial point that I want to make, this exclusion it is not simply the exclusion of the other side or half, but about all the exclusion of the very, or if you want, the repression of the very split, of the very division, of the very antagonism as such, or if you want, of the non-relation. It is not, we should not simply directly see, the moment that women appear as political subjects, it's not simply that the other half that has been excluded from political existence for so long now appears that it is excluded in this space. No, it is the very problematic, antagonistic structuring of this space itself that comes to light. The divide itself, the struggle, the antagonism is what becomes apparent. Not simply that this uh, ha empirical half of the human race, I said before, was excluded, of course. But with this, it's not simply we should not say now they are included. No, what is what appears is the divide, it is the struggle that now has to take place and has to be uh, played out precisely in, uh, in public, in, in the public space. And I think this is what makes this kind of political explosive, the very uh, way in which the, the non-relation is kind of inscribed into the very political negotiations of the uh, concrete or empirical uh, political life. Okay. Uh, and I think it's very similar if we look uh, at the history of uh, kind of political or, or class oppression, we can also see how the 
this kind of enforced idea of a harmonious system or social organism, which is somehow synonymous with relation with the capital R, has always been accompanied by the most brutal forms of exclusion and oppression. I mean, like, all these societies based on what, slavery and so on, they, they saw themselves as this kind of a harmoni harmonious organisms functioning in a very relational way. Okay, but now the next important point is that I think what follows from Lacan's theory is not simply something like, okay, let's then simply acknowledge the impossible, the non-relation, and instead of trying to force it, uh, to make it a relation, rather put up with it. Because this, indeed, I think it's now kind of the official ideology of the contemporary secular form of social order and domination, which precisely has abandoned this, uh, abandoned this idea of a uh, harmonious totality to the advantage of the idea of this non-totalitizable uh, to multiplicity of singularities form, forming a kind of democratic network, would be the liberal version of this. And in this sense, it may even seem that the, the non-relation is the dominant ideology of capitalist democracies. And I think it actually is, but understood in this simply haunting level that I was kind of uh, explaining as the wrong way of understanding the relationship at the beginning. Uh, we are all conceived as kind of more or less precious singularities, these elementary particles trying to make our voices hurt in a complex, non-totalizable social network. This is a kind of a picture. Um, so there is no predetermined uh, social relation. Everything is negotiable or almost everything depending on us and on concrete circumstances. This, however, is, I think, very different from what uh, Lacan's non-relation claim aims at. And now I will kind of, on a different level, repeat what I was saying uh, earlier. Namely, this acknowledged absence of the relation does not leave us with a pure pluralistic neutrality of social being. This is not what non-relation means, that there is no relation, so it, this is just there is this multiplicity which is purely neutral and then we then force it to, for this or that reason in wrong way or co co compose it in wrong way. Uh, this is not at all the acknowledging of what non-relation means, I think, in this Lacanian sense. What it means is precisely that there is no neutrality of social being. Uh, that social being is biased in this precisely because of this dysfunction of its structure itself, the structure itself of being. Um, the non-relation is not a simple absence of relation, but refers precisely to a, what I call a kind of constitutive curving or bias of the discursive space as such. Uh, this space is uh, biased by the precisely missing element of the relation, but this uh, missing thing which is not there literally curves the space, like introduces a certain asymmetry, if you want, a certain antagonism which is not simply um, in, in which prevents any kind of uh, original ontological neutrality, so to say. And this is precisely the problem why also there is this kind of connection between thinking uh, in these terms and uh, uh, seeing this in a political perspective. In this sense, to conceive democracy, for example, as a more or less successful negotiation between elements of a fundamentally neutral social being is indeed to overlook or even to repress precisely this consequential negativity, which is operative at the very core of the social order. Once again, it's to repress or to hide or to uh, disavow this antagonism, this um, division. And it is also just another form of the narrative of the relation. 
which becomes quite clear if we think about how the political and economic ontology of this non-totalizable multiplicity of neutral singularities is usually accompanied by the idea of some kind of self-regulation that we take care of it. And for instance, this invisible hand of the market is a showcase of this. And I will return to this in a, in a moment. So, you see, this is also something that I think it's very briefly, I already said yesterday, and this is something that we, it's not my original idea, Zizek has written on this, on, on this uh, at several points, uh, the fact that antagonism, social antagonism, is not to be conceived simply as existing between um, individual elements of the social space, but as kind of inscribed into the, the, the asymmetry, into the curving of this social space as such. So it's not simply a question of, uh, of, of these elements, or if it is, it is precisely because these elements themselves already bear the mark of the non-relation. They are not simply neutral elements, they're in the space. They, there is this spin of the, of the problem of this uh, negativity that is actually ontological part of their being there, of their existence. This minus and then this plus that becomes, that gets generated uh, at the point of this minus, this surplus enjoyment, this uh, object that is not a simple object that is involved, as I said, in all this forming of the ties and so on. So acknowledging the non-relation does not mean accepting the impossible as something that simply cannot be done, so we just have to live with all the injustices that are there. But uh, it means to see how this uh, non-relation actually adheres to all things possible, informs them, and what kind of antagonism it perpetuates in each concrete case, and how. So, at least in my view, this kind of acknowledgement far from closing it, actually, actually opens up the space of political invention, intervention. It doesn't mean that no, we, there is no relation and there will never be, so we just give it up. No, it, it is precisely what opens up the, the space for kind of a political intervening into the social space, because it says that this social space itself is ridden by a certain impasse, by a certain problem. It is not simply some structure, it is a structure that dominates us, that uh, it is an oppressive structure, but it is also a structure that itself oppresses further because it is itself oppressed by a certain inherent problem. So, okay, I will now move to some perhaps slightly different or um, more contemporary even way of trying to look at this. Namely, if I said before that the these most authoritarian social orders um, were usually those which aimed at freeing the social uh, from the non-relation, that is to say social orders built in the name of the relation, capital R. Uh, but if we look at today predominant forms of social relations of power, of domination, of exploitation, discrimination, we can also say that they are first and forms, in foremost, I would say, forms of exploiting of forms of exploitation of the non-relation. And I will now try to explain this, but um, uh, just one more thing. Perhaps this seems like being in contradiction to what I uh, said earlier, but perhaps we can also see in it a way of distinguishing between, distinguishing between two kinds of uh, authoritarian orders, or two kinds of uh, uh, project. One is the abolition in the, of the non-relation as, let's say, emancipatory project. And the one is what we may call narratives of the relation, which are actually in the service of the most vicious and social and economic exploitation of the non-relation. Abolition of the non-relation has been, in fact, perhaps the way in which the, also the authentic revolutionary projects of the 20th century 
often understood the path to radical emancipation. And the, the, the often catastrophic results of this kind of politics were kind of inherent to the very honesty of the will to abolish the non-relation. You know, the, the modus operandi of engineering a new order and a new man has been that of exposing the kind of non-relation and attempting to force it out of the social equation at all possible, by all possible means. Uh, and I, I claim this is very different in its logic from what we may call the, what I call the exploitation and also segregation of people by presenting a given form of social antagonism or non-relation as kind of ultimate relation. And this is, I think, what is very much what we live today. Ultimate relation, supposedly also, of course, protecting us from the utter chaos of the non-relation. Um, in this way, social injustice directly translates into a higher justice, which is being served. Uh, so at work here, it's not at this crazy attempt to abolish the non-relation as the fundamental negativity, but rather disavowing it while at the same time appropriating it as a generic and very productive point of social power. And this is a truly, I think, political lesson of uh, a psychoanalysis. Power, and particularly modern power, works by first appropriating a fundamental negativity of the symbolic order, let's say its constitutive non-relation, while expanding it by building it into a narrative of a higher relation. And this is also what puts into place and perpetuates the relations of domination. I would really say that the, the actual, the concrete exploitation, empirical exploitation, is kind of founded on, based on, made possible and fueled by this more fundamental appropriation, this privatization of the negative, as precisely the site when surplus products or surplus value also is generated. And I will come to this in a moment. So how much time do I have still left? Well, yeah. I guess we would have some time. Uh -huh, no, but because I see it's already, uh -huh, I don't know, I, I thought I, I thought I had a shorter paper, but... Uh, we are not super okay. limited in time, so we really are still alive. Um, Okay, so let me just see if I can uh, make this a little bit... Okay, I will just say a, a few words. I'm not sure if then if we will come to, to Marx, although I thought to end up a little bit with Marx, but I will just perhaps explain a little bit uh, what I was saying here, uh, because there is something very interesting. If you look at uh, capitalism and uh, how it started, uh, you discover that it actually starts off with two very revolutionary ideas, which I would uh, design as follows. First, the economic relation does not exist. I think this is the first claim of capitalism. The economic relation does not exist. And second, the non-relation could be very profitable. So this first idea I mean, that uh, corresponds, to put it very briefly, to the, this 18th century economist led by Adam Smith, uh, who precisely put into question this previous mercantile doctrine and belief, uh, which was that the amount of world's wealth remained constant and that a nation can only increase its wealth at the expense of another nation. This was this image of a kind of closed totality um, in which the relation ensures also the visibility of the difference in wealth. If you want more, you have to take it somewhere else. So somebody has to lose. Uh, so this is a relation, it's a relation of sub subordination, uh, but still it is a kind of uh, uh, relational space. The new economic idea undermines this totality-based relation 
while at the same time uh, prizing the pro productivity of the newly discovered non-relation. Namely, the word wealth can increase by itself. This was Adam Smith's uh, thesis. Uh, with, of course, the industrial revolution and the new organization of labor being the primal sources and carriers of this increase. And I'm really putting this in the crudest and most simple terms to expose the, the kind of silent structural threats of this shift. So what is the fundamental discovery of capitalism? That non-relation is there, but that it is also very profitable. That is the ultimate source of growth and profit. And with this came the idea that this being so, there is also no reason why everybody couldn't profit from it. And this is how we got, of course, the narrative of a new higher relation, the foundational myth of modern capitalism known as the invisible hand of the market. Um, and this is really interesting because uh, Adam Smith kind of capital idea, starts out from precisely positing a social non-relation um, as a fundamental state also on another level, and this is precisely related to the invisible hand of the market. Namely, as elements of social order, individuals are driven, according to him, by, of course, egotistic drives and pursuit of self-interest. But out of this purely egotistic pursuits grows a society of an optimal general welfare and justice. This is still Smith. Uh, so it is precisely by ruthlessly pursuing one's own interest that one promotes the good of social as, social as a whole. And much more efficiently so than when, if one just sets off to promote it directly, like in a, I don't know, for the love of the of other human beings. So as Smith puts it in, in a famous quote from the Wealth of Nations, he says, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love and never talk to them of our necessities, but of their advantages. You see, this is the the very story that also we've been told many times that it's precisely if we just let things everybody look after their own interests somehow the whole society will be better off and what i think is interesting about this idea is how it kind of takes a first step in the right direction and then of course stops short before the crucial next step so the idea is that what we find at the very core of the most selfish individual enjoyment, we put it this way, is actually the other, the big other looking after a general welfare. So it is this idea. But what is missing, I think, is the next step, which is, and what we find at the same time, at the core of this big other looking for our general welfare, is precisely a most masturbatory self-enjoyment. So I think Adam Smith's mistake is not that he saw the dimension of the big other possibly at work in the most selfish pursuits of individual interests. All in all, this thesis is not simply wrong. We never do just what we think we are doing and what we intend to do. This is, after all, kind of fundamental Hegelian and Lacanian lesson. His mistake was that he did not follow this logic to the end. He failed to see that where and how the other and its invisible hand also do not do only what they think they are doing. And of course, this is what becomes obvious with every economic crisis and became overwhelmingly clear with the last one, namely that left to itself, suppose that even though it was never fully left to itself, the market or the other is bound to discover solitary enjoyment, as the English phrase has it. And actually, Aaron Schuster once used the expression 
the invisible hand job of the market, <laughs> which I'm borrowing here because I think one can hardly find a better way of putting what I'm trying to articulate, namely the invisible hand of the market supposedly looking after general welfare and justice is always also and already the invisible hand job of the market, putting most of the wealth decidedly out of common reach. Um, so why, no, okay, now I have to make the decision. Uh, do I still have 10 minutes or okay. we stop here? I mean, the, we can also stop here and discuss. I have, a, I link this to Marx, so it's a, another, yeah, 10 minute argument of some perhaps uh, conceptual difficulty and interest, but we can also stop and just... Up to the audience. Uh, 10 minutes of Marx, minutes. okay. Uh, so I think uh, Marx actually saw very well that non-relation was uh, very profitable and how this could happen. He saw it perfectly, namely that in order for the non-relation to be economically productive, profitable, exploitable, it has to be built into the very mode of production. And actually in his analysis of in the capital, uh, he situated this at the precise kind of structural point when labor appeared on the market as yet another commodity for sale. This is a very interesting point of his analysis. It is the key point uh, of what he uh, um, analysis, uh, uh, analyzes as the transformation precisely of money into capital. It's the birthplace of the capital. So to put it very simply, what makes the product, namely the labor power, also appears with products on the market as one of the products. Objects for sale. And this paradoxical redoubling corresponds precisely, I would say, to the point of this structural negativity and its appropriation as the locus of markets, this miraculous productivity. So the, the money owner finds on the market a commodity whose use value possesses this peculiar property of being source of value. There is this kind of lapse of one into another. And whose actual consumption of this commodity is a creation of value. There is this kind of, the, the relation is broken down here. This is why it is too simple to say also that what capitalists have more of, they have stolen from the workers. This kind of claim still, I think, presupposes this kind of an old closed relation based economy. No, what capital exploits is precisely the point of negativity or entropy of this productive uh, uh, mode of production of social order with the workers situated at this precise Point. So capitalists are not so much stealing from the workers as they are employing them to make this negativity, this kind of lapse of the system work for them, the capitalists. To do, they, they are making themselves enriched. They need workers to do their hand job, so to say. Um, and this, I think, is really what Marx recognized as the concrete structural point of the non-relation in capitalism serving as the condition of its type of production of exploitation. So labor power as commodity is the point that makes the constitutive negativity, this gap of the, the that marks the, the, the negativity, the gap of this system. The point when one thing immediately falls into another, use value into the source of value. There is no mediation here. Labor is a product among other products. One buys it, money or buys labor. Yet it is not exactly like, like other products, where other products have a use value and hence a substance of value. This particular commodity has no substance but leaps over or lapses to the source of value. There is this slippage. It has no substance of its own. 
And this could also be put in, in a formula saying the worker with capital W does not exist. What exists and must exist is the person whose work is sold and bought. And this is why it is essential, according to Marx, that the person working does not sell himself, his person. Uh, he put it, converting himself from a free man to a slave, from an owner of commodity into a commodity. He must constantly treat his labor power as his own property, his own commodity. You know, that it, precisely this, this show, this charade needs to be there. And I think this also shows us how this usual humanist complaints about how in capitalism we are all commodities uh, miss the point. What Marx is saying here is that if we were indeed just commodities, capitalism wouldn't work. We need to be free persons selling our labor power as our property, our commodity. Then it, it works and it enables this negativity to circulate in a productive way. Uh, okay, and I think that the Marxian concept of the, this famous, unfamous proletariat could be seen precisely as formulating the fact that in capitalism, this worker in this sense does not exist. Worker that existed would be actually a slave. This is why the proletariat is not simply one of the social classes, but rather names the point of this concrete constitutive negativity in capitalism the point of the non-relation obfuscated and exploited by it. The proletariat is not the sum of all workers, it is the concept that names the symptomatic point of the system. And this is why I think Lacan held that Marx invented the symptom precisely. Uh, it's disavowed and exploited negativity. And I think this general Marxian idea has lost none of its pertinence also today. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, now should we start uh, the Q&A session? Uh, if someone, uh, if you want to ask a question in Russian, uh, you can also do that and we will try to translate. Then back. But also questions in English are welcome. Uh, the question is, um, in this logic, uh, can we say that not only sexual relations do not exist, but also a non-sexual relation do not mm -hmm. exist. Um, yeah, I would put it like this. Um, what Lacan, I mean, what is said and formulated by this formula that uh, sexual relation does not exist is precisely somehow, paradoxically, that non-sexual relations don't exist. I mean, it's... Uh, it is not, uh, I don't think the way to understand this uh, is simply to uh, extrapolate or try to locate sexuality uh, as, a, as, a, as a certain sphere and you say, okay, here is a sexual sphere and there is no relation. And this is non-sexual sphere and there are also non-relations. What I, what I try to, to, to show and to argue through this uh, analysis, also kind of ontological analysis of this Lacanian claim, is precisely that as such, uh, this claim on, social, uh, on sexual non-relation is uh, consequential for the entire social space. That it's not simply, uh, that it doesn't kind of leave out uh, any space in which, we, which would be simply in this sense non-sexual because this would simply mean outside the non-relation. It would mean, uh, okay, non-sexual relations, they are relations, why not? I mean, it's, uh, it is, but not because they have any in this kind of uh, sexual meaning, uh, but because they are uh, part of the discursive structure which has this non-relation kind of built into it. So it's, uh, it is a much more kind of, uh, 
ambitious or if you want spectacular thesis which actually says something about the um, something pertaining to this non-relation, something that can be kind of deduced from what psychoanalysis does in relation also to sexuality, which actually in consequence is of a much more uh, general bearing considering the operation of the discursive order as such. So that uh, the non-relation, that, that uh, yeah, I would say that this would simply say that if there is a relation, it is uh, excluded from this space as such, not simply that it is non-sexual. It's uh, So obviously there are non-sexual non-relations, but in a more, uh, let's say, in a deeper sense, they are not non-sexual uh, at all. <laughs> but uh, it is also, you know, one way of putting is also that the, uh, the, the very, one way of formulating there is no sexual relationship would be also to say there are only non-sexual non-relationships. But it's still, uh, uh, one cannot simply separate the this sexuality as some specific uh, field where there is a certain logic that applies and then there is this other there are these other fields where this no longer applies this is precisely i think what i try to do goes against this kind of uh, division of ontology of labor of uh, whatever you you call it uh, but this does not mean that everything is sexual of course not everything is sexual but everything is uh, ridden by this uh, contradiction that also makes sex makes the sex itself something which is as i was telling uh, you yesterday something which is not simply there which is not obvious also in this sense so uh, sex itself is part of this thing that is not at all obvious or not at all uh, fully there or not at all um, non problematic so yeah something like this um, no, Marina, no, that. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for the paper. Uh, I have several questions, but um, I guess um, the most important for me is uh, uh, political implications for contemporary situation, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, because I guess this framework with um, uh, constitutive negativity works perfectly well with industrial capitalism and Marx. But how does it work? Uh, today, when we are no longer living uh, in uh, industrial capitalism, when um, uh, our capitalism, I mean, capitalism of today is probably characterized by either the very absence of any kind of relationship, when uh, instead of relationship we have uh, connection, or we have communication, or we have something else. Or uh, uh, the other way around, we are all the time related to, again, to uh, communication and so on. So uh, what your paper made me think about is that uh, today there could be two ways of thinking about it and two ways of um, using this framework. First, that this uh, constitutive negativity is again being conceived, concealed or uh, again exploited. And I'm kind of struggling to choose mm -hmm. what, would be, what would be the best, the, the most productive way of going on. Uh, of understanding what is going on. Yeah, I think actually that uh, first of all, although there are many points, perhaps in uh, in Marx and wider, where that uh, no one could say no longer. Uh, I mean, not that they no longer apply today, but uh, obviously the way capitalism uh, functions uh, it has changed to some degree, and uh, we no longer have industrial capitalism. But I think the the precisely the point that I was kind of picking up from Marx, uh, which concerns not so much the question of industrial capitalism, but this question of uh, entropy, of this kind of paradoxical uh, 
uh, this function, which is actually very production of the uh, mode of production of capitalism, which is labor and labor as labor there on the market, this very much still exists today. I don't think, I mean, we can be um, intellectual workers, we can be whatever, but the, 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 this very fact that we, first of all, are obviously not slaves, but we are selling our labor uh, at the, at the, um, on the market, uh, now even ruthlessly without any kind of uh, whatever social welfare guarantees that were uh, kind of regulating this hand job before, uh, kind of being asked to constantly event and re-event ourselves, uh, being extremely flexible in our modes of functioning, re-education, reinventing ourselves all the time. I think this is very much something that is there as a, a extremely a powerful mode of exploiting and further even on um, many higher degrees this kind of entropy, this kind of negativity precisely. That it's so we, are, we, we work, we are even, I mean you have all these self-employment plans now which are of course self-employment, this does not not mean that self-employment is simply about you employing yourself. It uh, Again it is part of the social structure which gets a lot of whatever can squeeze out of you because you employ yourself. So it's uh, so I don't think that this kind of um, mechanism or uh, social um, tick that I was trying to describe is something that is no longer there today uh, that or that it has changed uh, essentially with uh, this kind of uh, new uh, technology and uh, whatever, yeah, uh, media and uh, like softer versions of capitalism. What has changed is perhaps at, on one uh, on one hand this kind of uh, social uh, regulative uh, is losing its grip. This kind of idea even that we should nevertheless try to make the system more just or something like this, that, uh, that there is lots of things that are simply like collapsing, like the, the welfare state, okay, this is an old story. Um, but uh, so I think that uh, the exploitation of this uh, kind of negativity, uh, which is perhaps not so much disavowed here, this I kind of agree with you if this was one of your suggestions, that it is kind of even openly stated. Uh, so we can shamelessly say, Yes, of course, there is this, there is this injustice or whatever, but such is the world. What can we do? We have to do our best to uh, to make our way or to make our bread in this uh, in this situation. But uh, um, there is certainly nothing that touched, I think, or changed the, this fundamental um, configuration of uh, this kind of uh, negativity being the very site of production of surplus value. So this, I think, has not really changed. Uh, Jürgen. Uh, well, the previous question was uh, what's going on, and uh, my question is, uh, so what do we have to do? Yeah, <laughs> yes. yes. On all these levels, I mean, you yeah, yeah. speak about sexual, ontological. Do, is it enough that we just acknowledge the existence of non-existence, or existence mm. of a void, or there is some other step which yeah, I think, no, this is obvious. I mean, I just left out one part, which is not a reply to what we can do, because I am not saying that I know exactly what we can do, but one question that I think uh, was uh, for a reason recently uh, opened in this uh, general discussion, for instance, with uh, with Piketty and his, uh, his book, uh, was precisely uh, this. Can we keep the... Uh, the non-relation as source of profit, but kind of eliminate its hand job. That is to say, is there a possibility of um, keeping the profit and finding a certain way of really, uh, of some kind of a distribution of wealth that would be uh, more, yeah, just, that would be yeah, more just, that, that would kind of pre prevent all these big differences. So um, can we simply, uh, put our card, cards on the side of distribution and say, okay, we need this or that apparatuses. Uh, now here, the first problem is um, 
perhaps this could be done. I'm not saying that not, but at the same time, uh, there is this uh, interesting paradox. I think that uh, also at some point, uh, Zizek makes this claim, if we were actually able today to enforce the just distribution of this surplus value and profit in this world, then we would already be there. I mean, the revolution would somehow has to happen. There is who would enforce this? I mean, there is no power, no social structure that would be. We can, of course, uh, um, say, OK, why not just uh, try to enforce this big other in this sense, but then uh, nobody, no, uh, no party, no power, no state is in a position to do this. Then, OK, if not, then the question is again, what is then, uh, I don't think it's the question of accepting or not accepting the, the, the non-relation. I, I mean, uh, we, it, one cannot say, OK, Leo, now we will uh, abolish it. But I think one thing that one can, uh, and this is a modest conclusion, uh, deduce or one lesson that one can perhaps um, take from what I'm doing, or this is why I think this is important to stress these theoretical niceties and subtleties, is precisely that it is encouraging in the way of saying, because often you get today this narrative that this capitalism is simply run crazy, and whatever we do, it appropriates it immediately and sells it off even better. There is no resistance that is not immediately sold off as another product, and all this is very true. But I also think and insist that there is a certain problem which is obviously there and which is causing lots of antagonisms within capitalism itself, which is real. And in this sense, I think the only kind of what to do that I can deduce for all this is that capitalism is kind of uh, finite or open to certain kind of attacks. But uh, I'm also not saying that uh, it will ruin itself, or it, perhaps it will, because it is ridden by this uh, really difficult. I mean, now if you look at how the world is structured, not only in terms of uh, division of labor, of uh, exponential differences, uh, poverty and so on, of uh, political configurations, wars, refugees, also ecological crises and so on, uh, we, you could say, okay, this will all end very soon in some catastrophe. Uh, and here I don't cheer for this catastrophe in the sense that I don't think that in itself it can already bring a better world. It could simply become even worse if there is no kind of yeah, alternative um, idea or very concrete vision of what uh, a society or a social uh, tie should look like when this happens, when capitalism kind of eats itself or destroys itself. So, um, I, I don't know, it's, um, it's, so far I only have this kind of um, very, very tiny uh, practical advice, which is not to give up on this idea that it is very much full of its own contradictions, the capitalism, and that we somehow have to be on watch for them, and then sometimes there are these contingencies that happen. I mean, also in political struggles, something happens, um, some movement that perhaps starts in relation to something which is not a direct answer to the question what we will do now, and then something develops out of it which is completely surprising and manages to shift the entire discussion. And my only claim is that this is possible, it is still possible that this happens, but uh, I don't have a kind of recipe. Victor. Uh, first of all, thanks a million for today's continuation and the new emphasis on uh, the subject of sex. I have one question and uh, one very tiny comment. First, the comment. Uh, I don't know why you say that there is no uh, uh, industrial capitalism. To my mind, uh, we should talk about hyper industrial capitalism uh, because uh, the, the one of the main the uh, uh, domain of today's capitalism is uh, cultural industry, so it's not so much about uh, industrialization of different objects as much as uh, industrialization of the subject itself. It's, uh, it's just a short comment. And the, the uh, question concerns uh, uh, your idea, which is uh, very intriguing to me, of the object uh, disoriented ontology. 
and my uh, question is uh, about the notion of an object. What do you mean by object when you speak about mm -hmm. uh, object disoriented ontology? Because we could understand object just as, as an other, right? Because uh, we were uh, logically talking from Lyrakov-Sexual mm -hmm. the part that we speak about uh, uh, one of the consequences of it. Uh, then we could talk about object as object here, and then it's already another configuration because mm -hmm. it's more orienting than disorienting. Uh, then we could speak about uh, an, an object uh, in general, which is part of the subject itself. Uh, uh, so far as you know, there's it's impossible to create an opposition between subject and object. And then in the end, one more uh, uh, object cause du désir, mm -hmm. uh, if you could, we could speak about it as uh, disoriented. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will start with the second question. No, I'm sorry. I, we, uh, it was explicitly meant to refer to the object A. I mean, I use it, the, the object A disoriented ontology. And this would be, I mean, this because I think this is, and that what I said is if there is any ontology that follows from the Lacanian configuration, where precisely the object actually appears in this sense, um, okay, you say, why not orientated? Precisely because I think the whole idea of the object A is that it's kind of uh, orientated, the structure by way of disorienting it, it precisely, by kind of uh, biasing it, it in a certain way, which is precisely not, um, yeah, I think I kind of found, find it appropriate to say that uh, the relation between structure or the way the, the object A relates to the structure is by way of a certain disorientation in this structure itself, kind of throws it out of a joint, but at the same time still leads it. Of course, it's not uh, it's if you it's not simply uh, uh, airing around with no orientation, but uh, at the same time it is not a kind of this kind of a very direct uh, directly oriented. Thing it leads you around, but orientates you, disorientates you in this sense. Uh, so, but but um, the, the the first comment, I think, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the question was about the okay, the, the conditions of the industrial revolution as the kind of Marxian moment of the of the capital. But uh, what you say, of course, I mean, this is also to some extent what I said in my reply that. Uh, today, not only uh, not only now objects or materials or, or, or raw materials in this industrial sense are being uh, f the fuel uh, and the, the subject used to kind of squeeze out to them the, the surplus value. Uh, it is also the subject themselves. We are asked to yeah uh, invent, reinvent ourselves to to kind of there is this redoubling of the labor of, I mean, we are, perhaps this could be a good way of saying, putting it, that not only um, um, we are kind of use value that uh, immediately transforms into the source of value, but there is also, we sell, we sell our labor, but we also sell our subjectivity. And our uh, kind of, the, the subject itself is now also one of the products that we are supposed to produce out of ourselves uh, in, and so the, the this whole um, elegy this whole kind of glorification also of uh, subjectivity of our inner life of our feelings also which it goes hand in hand with this ruthless uh, life conditions and exploitation is uh, is no coincidence i mean this uh, we are still even if uh, exploited to the uh, worst possible degree we are still encouraged to think of, of ourselves as this kind of precious singularities that are capable of and this of course is uh, another problem and uh, here precisely there is perhaps some space where one could intervene by uh, rejective to this kind of psychological depth feelings and so on that we are constantly asked to have and kind of put at least a little bit more poker face on our face when uh, working in these conditions, yeah. Sorry? Uh, just to continue, to, if to come back to the uh, object A, uh, then we should, uh, it seems to me we should think that 
how uh, the position of the objects changed in nowadays reality. I mean, it's not the same case, it's not the same voice uh, mm -hmm. uh, when we come to uh, the society of control in the in Deleuzean sense. Uh, it's already another um, uh, case and another voice which uh, appears and confuses. So, uh, I mean, you were talking, and I agree completely, that uh, the function of the obje object is exactly to uh, keep the structure uh, in its uh, in the way it works, but when the object reappears, then the structure is disoriented. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. I agree, especially if we uh, consider how it works in nowadays conditions, and these conditions are completely different. It's really uh, disoriented because of the ob objects changing uh, the position and uh, appearing all, all of a sudden. Uh, could you just give an example, for, oh. for example, uh, because I'm not completely sure I... Well, uh, okay, I, I'm talking also in, in a sense about uh, the uh, different ways of registration of the voices and, and uh, the, of, of the gaze, the, especially the voice which might appear not, that, uh, not as it was before, because of the systems of registration, it appears uh, all of a sudden from uh, different devices like, like this one, for example. <laughs> so it's technological, uh, okay. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. okay. In this sense, it, it's disorienting. Um, yeah, I mean, it is... Or, or if you, uh, I mean, either we think historically or not. If, if not, then, then I don't really understand. If it was always disorienting. Uh, no, I think perhaps... Uh, uh, there are two kinds of discussions going on here. I very much agree with what you say and what I think we don't use the word disoriented in the same way. Uh, I very much agree with your political analysis here that there is an absolute disorientation that is a kind of empirical fact that we can observe in um, in even though we all think that now we with all this also new technology and new ways of uh, living we have means of um, knowing better uh, what what is up with the world, but actually it's much more confusing in this But, uh, and this is perhaps, because I just used one very small part from, uh, from the book, uh, my argument there was actually related to something different, and of course the, the play on the words come directly with this, from this object-oriented ontologies, which, are, which call themselves as such today, and which are kind of absolute fashion in philosophy. So, and there it is simply the idea that you, that the object, but there it's objectivity and materiality should orientate to ontology. And my point was that if you understand that there is this spectral objectivity that Lacan invented as the objectivity are, and if you take this into account, then you cannot simply speak about object oriented ontology because this object kind of uh, is by definition kind of in a declination or disoriented. So this was uh, the, the reason I used this expression was very uh, much related to a certain like a philosophical usage of the word oriented object, oriented ontology, and kind of trying to say in one se sentence why uh, precisely for Lacan one cannot, uh, object is not something that one can directly uh, use as an orientation point because it actually it is already uh, behind us orientating us to some extent. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. So, насколько психоанализ является для философии тем, что ну как ну может примирить её с софистами в построении антологии? И если Аленко uh, could um, uh, psychoanalysis potentially reconciliate uh, philosophy and sophistic? And the third part. Ah, the second one. If there is a And uh, if you have uh, works on uh, ethics and ontology, do you also have uh, ideas on gnosiology? No, to the last question, I think not so. I mean, not that I have so. Uh, but the, the first one, I didn't uh, get it. It's the, if it can reconcile the sophistry and. And sophistry and philosophy. In philosophy. If second. Uh, 
Uh, I think this is um, okay. This is a very long story of uh, I mean philosophy is f philosophy is sophistry part of philosophy or is it something simply outside? I mean uh, it started as a philosophy and then there is this uh, so to say uh, immanent class struggle within philosophy, uh, which is the between sophist and non-sophist, which is also I think to some extent um, played out. Uh, later on, I mean later from uh, antiquity uh, and still today in this uh, quarrel of, or opposition between uh, nominalism and realism, basically. You can simply, uh, the, the, also the, this uh, object-oriented ontologies, which are very different uh, if you take a look, closer look at them, but somehow basically their idea is that they are uh, realist and they are real philosophers and uh, whoever insists in this way or another on this kind of a yeah, category of the subject and so on, they are sophists. I mean, there, there is this kind of uh, correlationist circle, this kind of speaking of uh, things only in relation to the subject, which by definition is a kind of, or should lead to kind of sophistry or um, relativization of any objective truth. Uh, here I think psychoanalysis uh, is and has always been something that actually that does not fill in, in either of these two camps, uh, but kind of shifted this uh, very opposition in a very, very important way. And this is yet another reason why I really think it's very productive to uh, work with it, because it kind of liberates us from this much too simple, I think, opposition between realism and nominalism, between sophistry as saying, okay, but there is no final truth, there are only perspectives, there is whatever we do, is this is all relative and so on. And this kind of often uh, naive realism which simply kind of exclaims, but we should get out of this realistic again. With, 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 um, and then very often dismisses very, very um, interesting theories that already structure this uh, in a different way. So I think, uh, for me, psychoanalysis is precisely a way how to think of a subject as something which is not simply a subjective point of view on object, but something, first of which, which is already there with the object, but with, which also only allows us, I mean, this is how, how I put it, uh, just, I think this is just one sentence, I cannot explain it here, but I think, what follows from psychoanalysis is that if we want to, if we want to get to the objective reality, to the reality such as it is, without object, we need the subject, because precisely subject is not simply a subjective perspective. It is also, as Lacan calls it, the answer of the real, or it is a response to a certain again structural or objective impasse, and we cannot learn or get to this. Uh, think without, if you simply abolish the, 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 or forget the notion of the subject, we kind of deprive ourselves of the very means, I think, of getting to the real, or to, 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 to speak of the real in a way precisely which is not mediated by the subject, but uh, kind of uh, brought to any, kind, to any kind of epistemological, epistemological value precisely because the subject exists, not simply because of what it thinks or not, but uh, because it exists. Because the subject is not an individual, it is not simply a person the, it is facing objects and having ideas about it. For Lacan, subject is really something that is inherently produced within the ontological chain of uh, signifiers. It is not something that comes from outside and then uses these signifiers or uh, in order to speak about object. So, and this same argument could be made for a psychonetic theory of the object, of truth, and so on. It is not opposed to, uh, ob I mean, if Lacan says, for instance, truth has the, the, the uh, structure of fiction, this is not a sophist claim. It doesn't uh, say that uh, truth is an illusion or just an invention. It says that precisely beca because truth is something that is uh, that can come in an immediate contact, very close to the real, it cannot simply be truth about the real, or that we need a certain stories or stru fictional structures in order to, 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 to say the truth. 
uh, which could not be said in other ways by simply uh, kind of directly uh, saying something. So it's, uh, there, there, I mean, I won't go on, but I think it's not about reconciliating perhaps um, sophistry and uh, philosophy in this more emphatic sense as it is about perhaps um, shifting the opposition between them in a very interesting way, in a way that uh, allows for different theorizations of this uh, whatever uh, du duel. Xenia. Um, thank you very much for your speech. And um, I have a little comment on sophistry and psychoanalysis that just came to my mind. That, um, so we know one of the basic characteristics of uh, sophists, class sophists, uh, it, uh, it's people who take uh, money for their speech. Mm -hmm. No, so uh, psychoanalytic uh, is kind of uh, reversed. Uh, so <laughs> no. Psycho uh, psychoanalytic uh, takes money for listening, not for speech. And uh, I just a joke, and I have a kind of formal question, uh, maybe on your method, <laughs> because now you, uh, at the beginning of your uh, paper you're talking about. Uh, Psychoanalysis and uh, ontology, uh, and their uh, common point, uh, their common point, uh, as far as I understand, uh, it's a contradiction uh, because ontology deals deals with uh, contradictions, and uh, psychoanalysis uh, it's also something about contradictions uh, and sets and so on. But uh, when we uh, find ourselves in the realm of ontology, when we deal with Contradiction. Uh, we deal uh, also with dialectics, yeah. And in psychoanalysis, uh, when we have contradiction, we are talking about uh, non-relation. So uh, non-relation and dialectics, uh, as they <laughs> have something in common. So mm -hmm. can we speak about uh, non-relation as a concept uh, of dialectics, or maybe non-dialectics? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for these questions. Um, First, yeah, the, the comment about sophistry, it's a, yeah, it's a good, funny one, and I, of course there is all, also this debate here, one clearly has to take sides at some point. There are people, for instance, Barbara Kassan, who is both philosopher and psychoanalyst, and she simply claims that, yeah, this is sophistry, and it is good that it is sophistry, and, uh, and I mean, I, I really kind of uh, admire her work a lot, but don't like agree all the way with uh, with this claim because I think there is, um, but okay, I, I won't go into this. So it is uh, the question whether psychoanalysis is simply sophistry or not is a, a different question. Uh, now to your second uh, remark or question. First of all, uh, I, yeah, the, the paper was kind of composed of uh, certain parts of the book that I think could perhaps fit together you know, without too much harm done to what was uh, because of what uh, was left out, but still necessary some harm was done. So I went perhaps too quickly. The, what I wanted to say at the beginning is not that they have this contradiction in common, it was simply a claim saying that uh, these points are seem to be exterior. Uh, to, to their operating, that uh, uh, sexuality seems to be completely exterior to the field um, um, that philosophy works with or is ready to work with, and uh, ontology seems to be exterior to the way in the, so, and it is precisely, it's not even contradiction, but this, uh, um, this is, there is a limit, and we cannot go there or integrate this, this is what interested me, how then to cast them in the opposite uh, in the opposite camps, so to say, how to cast ontology as a problem in psychoanalysis via uh, the question of sexuality, and how to cast sexuality as a problem also of philosophy in, the, in some sense. So uh, uh, this was this is a kind of a general methodological, also if you want, approach. As for the dialectics and non-relation, yeah, again, of course, there you know. Uh, uh, Lacan didn't think very highly of dialectics, but yes, uh, yet at the same time, you know, it is the same as with his comments and things that he says about Hegel. He is um, sometimes very critical of Hegel, yet using him a lot, or also being, uh, as many have argued, uh, very much a Hegelian avant la lettre. So, uh, 
the whole question then becomes what is dialectics, what is uh, contradiction, what is non-relation. And I think that to some extent, precisely the argument, which is directly from Lacan, this is not something that I invented, that I presented at the beginning about how the non-relation is the very condition of the, rela the, the relation that exists. I think this is finally a kind of dialectical arg argument that he's making there, in a, saying, but in a certain way of understanding dialectics, which is not perhaps the, the obvious way, but it has a certain um, yeah, uh, way of uh, putting things uh, in, in motion or in, in, in contact, which is not obvious and which is not also immediate. It is the, the, the whole claim that it is not simply the obstacle. I mean, it's a very Hegelian claim that non-relation is not that you have two objects and then you have this obstacle that prevents them from, uh, from relating. Uh, instead of this, you say, no, this is not the problem. The problem is that these objects are already, or the space itself is such that they cannot uh, relate in this, this is not even the question, but at the same time, this very space generates something that ties them nevertheless, and they, they are part of this space, in, they form a tie in this space. And so this could be conceived as a dialectical argument in, in some way, but yeah, then the, uh, so I'm not, uh, I don't think that, and then the whole Hegelian point about contradiction being the very um, prerequisite of truth, I mean, this is something that the whole philosophical tradition went against. I mean, this it was really a kind of a scandalous thing today that contradiction is the truth. It's not, and not that everybody almost before was about how to eliminate contradiction from philosophical arguments and for uh, so as to uh, precisely come to truth. And uh, Hegel had this, yeah, very revolutionary idea and saying, no, uh, when there is contradiction, there is truth, and precisely we uh, work from there. So I think this is not very far from at least some things that uh, psychoanalysis is doing as well. Uh, may I ask? A, uh, I have a comment uh, and and a question. Um, first of all, and uh, I'm also trying to uh, to continue Xenia's line in this uh, brief comment. When I uh, I myself was always trying to. Uh, to explain to myself Lacanian uh, formula, that there is no <laughs> sexual relation, uh, I was just translating it as there is no class relation, and uh, but there is an antagonism which breaks uh, this alleged u unity of the nation based on uh, bourgeois values, whatever. Uh, so uh, that's how I did understand uh, this. Uh, and what I uh, really uh, appreciate in, in your uh, work, uh, in your um, political ontology of sex here, uh, is that you really put together the, this, the class, uh, the question of, of the class and the question of sex. Um, the more I was listening, uh, the more I was thinking about this figure of the worker, uh, which is about all of us, in a way, uh, the workers uh, we uh, who are being free individuals sell ourselves as commodities. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the definition is really great and very precise. Uh, so th that we are not commodities, but we sell ourselves as commodities, being a free as free persons, mm -hmm. uh, which cannot buy but remind me about this paradigmatic model of such a work. This is a sexual worker. A sexual mm. worker is a free individual who goes mm. to the market and um, deliberately sells uh, herself uh, as, a, as a commodity, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and in contemporary capitalist society, what we do as uh, sexual workers, all of us, uh, what if we do a very specific kind of se sexual work uh, which has a masturbatory character. Um, so these are not really the market, the invisible market who does a hand job, but we ourselves in our, as our uh, alienated, actually, as our alienated uh, work. Um, example. Uh, let me give you an example. 
there is a profession now, uh, one of the new professions, uh, 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 come whore, uh, the web webcam uh, prostitute, so to say. So you have a uh, you have a, a webcam uh, and you like have a camera. Or uh, webcam. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, and the girl she has a camera at her <laughs> place, and uh, you say her, you tell her to do this or that, and she masturbates. That's what the only thing she does. Uh, and uh, um, or she can do some other stuff, but whatever she does, she 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 can also read a book or I don't know play video games, but she still. Her, uh, whatever she does is masturbation uh, because that's that's how he and you you just put some money on her um, credit card uh, uh, is this uh, so the question would be uh, this is a comment that's how I see uh, like this this uh, paradigmatic model for for them the hand job we do every day what we do which kind of job uh, we if we sell ourselves uh, ourselves as free persons, we we might think probably that this is not for real. You know, I I only sell a little bit. No one really. Uh, it's it's not. I'm not really into sex. I do something different, something similar, but a kind of a replacement of of sex. Some masturbatory activity, right? Uh, I I do not. It's like a touching without the penetration. Hegel had this penetration without touching, but but we do in this touching without the penetration, or even touching ourselves without the penetration, uh, and we receive uh, money and we produce value at the same time. Uh, that's what uh, we do when when we go whatever for whatever work. Uh, so, is this kind of acti uh, is this kind of activity is still a sexual activity. Uh, what is the line of uh, distinction between uh, masturbatory and activity and sexual relation or non-relation? Uh, this is the first question, masturbation. Then uh, one, uh, one more question is about uh, the, the human and inhuman. In, uh, you didn't mention it in the lecture, but um, in the first chapter of the book, uh, you say that uh, the, what is interesting about sex is that uh, it points not to the uh, to some humanity of the human, but to uh, something which you call the inhuman. Mm. Uh, the inhuman. Just maybe, maybe just a couple of words uh, explaining what is uh, what this could be. Uh, and uh, the last point is. Uh, uh, what is uh, with regards to all of this, or to all of was uh, what was uh, said? Uh, what is your idea of the unconscious? Uh, I uh, recently, in a uh, couple, just couple of days ago, in this audience, I mentioned Sama Tomsic, who is uh, the uh, um, the colleague of uh, the same. Uh, from uh, Ljubljana, and uh, he has a, a, this idea of unconscious as a worker, the, mm. the laborer. So, uh, which kind of work also our unconscious, which kind of uh, sexual work maybe, or masturbatory work uh, our un unconscious could do, or, uh, or, uh, or what, is, what is the place of the unconscious in, in these whole processes? Um, that's it. Okay, thank you. These are huge in many questions and plus the comment. So let me just try to organize a little bit. Um, I mean, about the, the, the what is unconscious, how it works. I, I did speak about this more in extensively yesterday, actually, uh, uh, emphasizing precisely that unconscious was not it's not simply some kind of container or sum of all repressed thoughts, but it is first of all a process, a labor, or the work of the, all this activity of uh, whatever substituting, repressed censorship, uh, condensation, and so on, but also related to this structural negativity that I was uh, trying to also to uh, describe today as a kind of uh, built into the, 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 the discursive order as such. So the, the, this kind of uh, uh, intensive work precisely related to this uh, gap of negativity is precisely how I see the Lacanian Freudian notion of the of the unconscious. 
Um, and now, if I go this way, yeah, back, uh, human, inhuman, yeah, the, what there is uh, a, even a t many points in the book, I, I make this claim that, and this is related to what I said before, that uh, of course for psychoanalysis also that already the subject, this is not simply a human being in this sense, like uh, individual or person. Uh, and uh, one of the ways in which one can see how they are different and what uh, kind of leads to subjectivity or something else is precisely what you referred to this idea that actually sexuality is something that kind of um, dehumanizes us in the sense that it disorientates us in a kind of very fundamental way, that it makes us subject precisely and not simply kind of uh, this uh, self-possessed unities of some kind of uh, whatever uh, humanity. So that it is a factor of dehumanization uh, in the sense that, that the, and disorientation that we cannot in no any immediate way now relate back to our bodies, to our sexuality, and as well as to, to truth and to others and so on. So uh, this is, I think, a very important point which could be argued and explained further, but okay, let this be it. Um, now the, the, to your kind of core question and comment. Yes, I definitely think, and I think that I'm really um, going into this direction with all this work, and perhaps I don't have a uh, ultimate formula with it, but I think there is a kind of significant sh short circuit, is if not even identity between uh, sexuality understood in this kind of uh, ontological way uh, and politics, which again is not about certain uh, sexual practices or not practices, but it is uh, it is more fundamental. So this idea that perhaps we are all sexual workers, uh, I find it very. Um, amusing, but precisely in the sense that um, we should see this particularly where there is no sex involved. I think if, we, if you just take this example that you know that there, there are these processes there, okay, there, this is the, they do their, the problem is that the, the very, the most obscene sex, sexual acts are there in this kind of a very sexless exploitation of selling ourselves in a very different way. So it's not where we find some kind of a Rabinis' sense of uh, sexuality, of prostitution, that we can recognize the kind of uh, obscenity of this, but it's precisely where uh, usually there is no even no trace left of this, but we can see the, even like, yeah, perhaps why not put it this way, the sexual obscenity of it at work in, in, in some way. And so this uh, hand job, uh, my idea was already there precisely that it is not simply the the, the workers are there to do the hand job for the capital. The, 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 precisely, this is uh, kind of uh, needed. So um, then masturbation, and then you, uh, if the question, if I understood the question, it was okay. There is this uh, question of sexual relations, but then there is only this pure masturbatory thing, and how uh, this combine. Um, you know, th there is this kind of. I, I started with some. It started, I think, with something even that already Woody Allen said, and then I'm sure Slava picked it up at some point. But the question, um, the whole question of the difference between masturbation and um, having sex, and there is this idea that uh, masturbation is sex with an imaginary partner, and then, and what is uh, sex? It is uh, masturbation with. Uh, no, it is the. Masturbation with a real partner, yeah. So that even there, I mean, if you have two persons or whatever a relation, this does not mean that it is not masturbatory in itself. And I think this is one important lesson of psychoanalysis and one way of saying there is no sexual relation, that this is no guarantee that you have two persons now looking to each other, that the whole act is not actually a joint masturbation. It can very much be so. And for something else to take place or to happen, some other shift take place. So um, the, the the very opposition is perhaps should be this should be kept in mind so as not to simply uh, to, to see that this kind of a, a masturbatory relations precisely also there where we are sold to see some kind of much more emphatic uh, relations precisely of uh, deep feeling subjectivity whatever how they can actually be exploited in a precisely in precisely this 
masturbatory way, but which is not uh, not at all uh, product productiveness. You know, because usually the, there is this idea of uh, masturbatory enjoyment as simply non-productive enjoyment, which is some. This is just pure waste. But I think here we actually get something very different, uh, which is very much uh, needed and uh, built into the the system as precisely this. Uh, enjoyment that is productive because it can be uh, repeated without too many, I mean, it, it, it's very uh, self-perpetuation or repetition are productive, so much more so perhaps than some kind of emphatic, whatever, love relation where there is productive exchange, but which is completely non-productive as far as the society and its uh, values and its profit go. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? No, it's late already. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. I forgot to thank you at the beginning for inviting me here.